So, well, welcome everyone. It is so nice to see so many of you here, uh, some of uh, familiar face and some of familiar names. Uh, welcome to the third session of Bridge the Gap virtual session uh, from Saunders Accounting Advisory Board. So we hope you and your family, friends and loved ones all well and safe and you remain that way. We are so sorry that we aren't able to host you here at Saunders College of Business as planned. We had a couple of very nice plans. Of course, we were planning to have a nice reception and a fabulous dinner. It would be fun to socialize and be together. Unfortunately, the time has dictated the otherwise. So I apologize for that. I hope next time when the event come around, we will be able to do that or something similar in our newly expanded building. Before we start, just one quick note. I just want to thank you for joining us. I know how much you have to do to balance your online learning, family, work, and other commitments. I also appreciate support from Saunders Accounting Advisory Board, Office of Alumni Relations, Office of Advancement, Office of Career Services, and Office of Communication. With that, now I turn to uh, our uh, Chair of Sam, uh, Rob, and um, uh, welcome everyone, and I hope you enjoy the session. Great, and thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, spring semester guest speaker session. This is our third and final one. Um, before we get started and I introduce our, our guest presenter, I'd like to go through a couple of quick housekeeping things for everybody. Uh, the first thing and, and most important, I wanna thank everybody for joining. And I wanna thank the Student Advisory Accounting Board, the spring committee for setting up today's session and, and really the speaker series. It, it's been a fun journey over the last uh, two of them, and then this is our third one. So thank you everybody for that. Uh, so before I introduce our guest speaker, let me cover a couple of quick things. Uh, we'll run today until about 5.15 p.m. Our guest speaker is comfortable taking questions during the presentation rather than at the end, and this will be fairly interactive. So there will be questions back to you. So please, I encourage everybody to join in and, uh, and come off mute, ask a question as you've got it. Now, if you're more comfortable typing it into the chat box as our presenter is speaking, I'll be monitoring the chat box and I can either ask on your behalf or I'll invite you to, to ask the question. So we'll, we'll do this as we go and you know, feel free to interact as, uh, as you would like. Um, we do ask though, while the presentation, if you don't have a question, please go on mute. And if you wanna keep your video off, it just makes the performance better for yourself, um, your call. And, and obviously if you're gonna ask a question, please turn your video on um, if you're comfortable with that. Um, to preventing the background noise, please uh, stay on mute uh, while um, you're not asking a question. But uh, anything else, uh, feel free to send a direct chat to me and I can assist where I can during the presentation. And now for the, the, the main event, as we'll call it, um, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Mr. John Erlob, a Rochester native and local business owner. A quick introduction about uh, our speaker. Mr. Olab is a graduate of St. Bonaventure University and began his career like many other Rochesterians back in the day at the Eastman Kodak Company. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, he started in finance and took some opportunities to explore and relocate in the US and even to Germany at one point, which could be a, a sign of the name of the, the company, but we'll let him go through that. Uh, he returned home to Rochester and in 1992 opened the first craft brewery in our area called Rohrbox. Now, over the last 30 years, Rohrbox has truly become a household name in Rochester, without question, offering both exceptional food and craft beer, along with remarkable customer service. Never had a bad experience there. And I can say personally, I've been a regular and frequent customer for the Rohrbox location on Buffalo Road. Um, their menu is extensive, but it's unique, and their craft beer is among the finest that I've had, and I've traveled the world quite a bit in my current job, and, and I can tell you without question, it's, it's some of the finest beer I've ever had. So without, that, without further ado, uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you John Erlob, owner and founder of Roarbox Brewing Company, to speak today. John, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Rob, thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that very kind introduction. You I, I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate your patronage over the years also. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I guess before I get started also, I wanna thank the advisory committee for inviting me. I've looked forward to this event and uh, hopefully that you will be able to take a few tidbits away. The way I went into this presentation was thinking that, um, you know, obviously we're talking to students 
I hope some of you have that thought in your mind that at some point you may want to start your own company and be an entrepreneur. And I hope I can give you some uh, some advice. What I'm basically going to do is tell you how my journey went. And uh, I do want to point out that many of the things that I might recommend or say that this is the way it worked for Rarbox doesn't mean it's the only way. Um, I'm a fairly conservative guy. Normally, entrepreneurs are a little bit more risk takers um, to go out on your own, to leave a corporate job, to, to start your own business does take some risk. But uh, I tend to be a little less risky. Some of the people that I know in, in even in our field in craft breweries took much greater risks and have much bigger companies now. So the advice that I'm giving you, take it you know, for it, it worked really well for me, but it's not the only way. Uh, I'm going to get right into it. Hopefully, we'll uh, engage everyone and let's see if I can get to the next slide. We'll get this all figured out. So um, I, I don't want to be cliche or, or tell you things that you know, but uh, experience really is uh, king. And I'm looking here. It looks like maybe I just hope we got the latest version. There might be another version of this uh, slideshow, too, if you want to look at, a, at an email, but I can go through it as it stands now. So experience is really king. Um, you may have an idea or a thought of what you want to do as far as a business project is concerned or uh, a unique idea or something you're passionate about. And right out of school, you want to just jump right in and get started. I wouldn't discourage you from doing that. Uh, in my case, I was able to work in, a, in the corporate environment. I had many different jobs. Um, I, I did. I, I do think education is really, really key. Also, as Rob mentioned, I went to St. Bonaventure. I did start out my career in finance. I had an economics minor. Uh, I would also tell you that I um, went to RIT, but I'm embarrassed to say that I never finished. And one of the recommendations today is don't do what I did. If you're going to jump into it, finish it up. You know, um, it was difficult for me because I had left Kodak and really I was just starting my family and I just opened my own business. So fitting those classes in even part-time were difficult for me, but the classes that I did take, I learned a lot from, uh, actually, um, what I started to do also is I left the MBA program, but I stayed at RIT and worked through uh, some of the, the I kind of non-matriculated, took some classes in the hotel uh, food and tourism area. And uh, those were also very helpful for me. But as you can see from the, from the uh, slide, I was a dishwasher and I was a landscaper, a server, a restaurant manager, credit manager, account executive, and I worked in the treasurer's division before I started Roarbox. So all of those added to the skills that I needed really to run the company. I also wanted to start out with a quick question. You don't have to answer this right away. Rob's going to keep an eye on the chat list. But for any of you that are in school now, if you have that uh, entrepreneurial spirit, are there ideas that you already have? Is there businesses that you know you want to go into? I'd really love to hear from you. Uh, I'm going to continue with my presentation, but feel free to put it in the chat and Rob, share it with me if you hear any responses. So let me tell you a little bit about Roarbox. Uh, before I get started too, I'm going to ask you another question. Just raise your hand, not that I can see you, but his, I hope some of you have heard of Roarbox. Uh, other than Rob, I hope you've been to the restaurant or maybe the beer hall at, uh, on Railroad Street, but I hope some of you have heard from Roarbox. Please let us know if you have. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, there are over 9,000 craft breweries in the United States right now. When Roarbox opened our doors in 1991, uh, there were 141. We were the 142nd brewery in the United States. Um, so I, I guess I just want to give you that mindset of what the world was like back then. It was very different than it was today. And craft beer really wasn't uh, fully understood by people and certainly wasn't as popular as it is today. Our very first customers um, were folks that were in the neighborhood. Uh, I knew in starting uh, Roarbox that because craft beer was not as popular as it is today, we had to do what we could to kind of grow our business, to have people understand what we were trying to offer to them. So the best way I could do that, we felt, was to um, invite people in, uh, give them great, great food, great service through a restaurant that people are used to, and then, of course, serve them a pint of Rohrbach beer. And in doing so, it was a slow way, but it was a way that we could grow and, and really be what I wanted to be, which was... A, uh, a true manufacturing craft brewery 
Uh, but we didn't start out that way. We were a restaurant. Uh, one of the other things that we did when we started out, and I think this is important, maybe this is a takeaway for you if, if possible, is that instead of me going alone, and of course, at the time I was married, so my wife was wrapped into this too, but instead of the two of us trying to do this on our own, we asked friends and family that were business-minded to join us on a uh, advisory committee so that the important decisions we made for locations and names and products and uh, the business plan, even though I wrote the business plan, I wanted others to look at it and make sure it was a solid plan. We put this advisory team together and it took a lot of pressure off me. You know, it's a stressful situation, but when you have a team of people kind of looking over your shoulder, making sure that you aren't making major mistakes in, in your plan, it makes it a lot easier. So I would recommend that if you're getting into a new business, um, bring some people on. And I can also tell you that I did allow them to invest in the business so they were true owners and that they had some true ownership uh, ownership and, and stake in the business so the decisions they were making, they felt they were making for their, on, on their own, uh, but they were small investments. Um, for me anyway, I didn't really want family and friends to significantly invest in Roarbox because I honestly didn't know it was going to make it. And I certainly didn't want the responsibility of failing with other people's money. So again, that's the conservative in me, but I did allow them to invest in the company. Uh, one of the other things we've done over the years was slow and steady growth that um, uh, really has worked out well for us. Again, every business entrepreneur has different plans. Some want to go national right away. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we controlled our debt and I didn't take on too much debt, but that we kind of paid as we went and we slowly grew, but I can tell you, I was very committed to grow every year. I think if you're not better quality uh, and, you, and growing that top line from year to year, then you're going backwards. You have to find ways to always grow and, and, and it enhances your employees and gives them additional opportunities and opportunities for increased compensation and challenges, uh, but it also allows the company to grow. So. I can proudly say that Roarbox grew for 28 years straight. 2002, we didn't grow. <laughs> a matter of fact, we had the hardest year we've ever had. And of course, everybody knows why. And it was something that was out of our control. Uh, but I'm extremely optimistic for the future and how we're going to come out of this pandemic, probably, I hope, stronger than ever. Um, we also opened two locations, two um, uh, kind of unique retail operations, as I said before. As a small business owner, I felt that having those retail operations is a direct connection to our customers. Um, I don't have a huge advertising budget. We don't do billboard signs all the time. We invite people like, uh, Rob, I'm gonna keep, continue to use you as an example, of folks that come into Roarbox and hear our story, sample our products. It's just a direct connection from our company and our staff to our customers and it's really worked out extremely well for us and actually the food service end of our business the beer hall and the brew pub uh, are both uh, really important operations for us right now they were more than half of our business until maybe five years ago where our wholesale business surpassed our retail volume so the other thing that uh, we uh, consider very important and it, it's you know, I will say a number of times that we got lucky in some cases, which we did, and luck is part of it, but uh, we kind of thought through some of this process. As the craft beer business has really blossomed, and, and again, there's 9,000 breweries, uh, there have to be over 500 just in New York State. I think in, in Rochester alone, and in, in our zip code, there's more than 20, maybe 25. So the world has changed a lot. And Consumers are really focused on local. And we were very, very lucky because we didn't go too far uh, outside of New York State. Matter of fact, we're still in the state. And even managing accounts in Albany or, or New York City or Buffalo or Syracuse or Southern is harder than it used to be. We can still, we would have the bandwidth to, to do that well. And people consider us local because we're New York. If we were in 13 states, I can tell you it, for a company of our size, it would be extremely difficult to have the bandwidth to try to convince those locals that they should buy my product when they have their own breweries right next door. And that's just how 
our industry has evolved, but you have to kind of think forward as you look at your business and decide who and what you want to be and be true to what those original principles were. But those have done, worked really well for us. Um, and, and we continue to grow that local market and our retail operations are very important to that. The other thing I would say is that you really have to, this is cliche too, walk the walk and, and not just talk the talk, but every day I tell our customers that they should support local businesses like Roarbox and that the quality of products that we put out are worth it and that the money that they spend stays in our area and they support their neighbors. Well, if I say that every day, I have to make sure that when I put my buyer's cap on, I, I follow through on that too, that, that also, and that I truly believe in it. And I really do. So that when we have purchasing choices for food or beverages or wine, I try to buy New York wines. We want to buy local as much as possible and really make sure that we walk the walk. And I do that. And I think our customers appreciate it too. Um, we'll talk about COVID later. But I can tell you the intensity that consumers have to support local has only gotten bigger through COVID. And I don't think it'll go away when we come out of the pandemic. I think it's something that's ingrained in people and they want to support local companies. So that has been to our benefit. Um, also, it's an important thing both for our staff because, you know, obviously they they know that we support local, other local businesses and it makes them feel better. But it also is an important selling tool for us to say, if you grab a Rohrbach off the shelf, you know it's as fresh as possible. It is local, it's supporting local businesses. And I think that gives us some cachet locally to, uh, to continue to grow our business. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say on local support was really that you, you, you talk about local support outside of your doors, but really, it's internally also. And that is that, you know, my philosophy in running this business is that attracting and retaining the best quality staff we can possibly get is my number one priority as the chief operating officer or CEO of this company. Um, and I focus on it every single day. And it is um, one of the things I tell people is that most people would say their customers are their number one priority. And I don't fault people for that, but if you drill down a little further from our standpoint, my staff is really my number one priority. And if you were to box me in a corner, or if I had a situation at the restaurant where someone's complaining about our staff and I either stand up for our staff or I uh, kind of give in to the customer's concerns, we certainly care about the customers. It's, it's of our utmost importance, but I would always um, side with the staff, to be honest with you, because they're the ones that are still with me. Customers do kind of come and go. And to be honest, when you translate a, a really good staff and have them focused on giving customer service, at the end, by focusing on your staff, you are providing the best possible customer service. So that's the other thing that I look at. It's, it's uh, making sure that you're focused on the right things within your business. Well, now that we're uh, talking to accounting students, uh, I have to tell you the reason I kept a little anecdotal uh, information here. The reason I didn't stay in accounting was that I barely made it through intermediate accounting. So I switched to finance. So I'm glad there's smart people like you that uh, I can kind of use as a resource to make sure that we do all the right things from an accounting standpoint. But I love accounting. Uh, it gave me the background. I do feel, and I might have mentioned this before, but as you start to think about um, starting your own business, you folks have a huge advantage. Um, you know, I've known, especially in the food service business, chefs that are extremely talented, passionate about what they do, want to open a restaurant, but really don't understand the financial side of the business. Uh, they're at a huge disadvantage. Uh, they may just understand food costs or, or focusing on labor, uh, but it's much more than that. And you can hire people. We have really great, a great accounting firm and a specific accountant that I work with. Um, but I have the understanding and I do the budgeting myself and I watch the plan very closely. It's important for any business at any size to have that understanding. And I would say you are all at a huge advantage uh, through the courses that you've taken and your accounting background. Uh, very, very important to do that. Uh, I also try to maintain strong banking relationships. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. The business is ebbs and flows. Uh, there'll be times where we're really 
in great shape from a cash standpoint. There's times that we that we aren't. We have credit cards that we have to take. There's lots of uh, interaction that we have with our bank, and we want to make sure that those relationships are strong. In the very beginning, I have to admit, when the bank realized that we were thinking about opening a restaurant, they were not overly interested in my business. Uh, it's a risky business, uh, but over time, uh, we continue to nurture that relationship. And right now I have very strong banking relationships and it was enabled me as we grew the first location we had, we had to rent because I certainly didn't have the money to purchase a building. But as we look just a few years later at purchasing our, or, or moving into our second location, we were able to get a mortgage on it, uh, buy the property and the land, uh, which has allowed me to really continue to reinvest in the company. That's the location that Rob mentioned on Buffalo Road. Uh, we've owned that for 25 years or so. But if I didn't have that banking relationship, I wouldn't be able to do it. And then when we were looking to expand and have a standalone brewery, which we have on Railroad Street here, which is the building I'm in, uh, we did the same thing. We went to the bank and said, hey, what are the chances of getting a mortgage? I don't want to rent space. I want to own the space. And those are critical elements when you're talking about food service or the infrastructure that goes into a building in order to allow it to be a brewery, plumbing and electrical. And we did lots of investments in this building. I wouldn't mind, want my landlord to say, okay, well, your lease is up. You got to find a new place. So that's worked out really well for us. The other thing is a I'm kind of telling you a little bit of a trade secret uh, for Roarbox in our business. And these are just decisions that you make as you're growing your business. Almost all others, and it is very standard in our industry to work through a distributor network. And the distributors do very, very well. I, I have no problem with them. I actually have distributors throughout the state that handle Roarbox product because we couldn't possibly do it on our own. But in the Rochester market, we have maintained self-distribution. So when, which, which, you know, forces me to have a uh, fleet of trucks and drivers and salespeople, I have to carry accounts receivable that most of the breweries don't have to worry about. They just get a nice big check from their distributor. Um, but it has allowed me to have a direct contact with our customers locally. And I can tell you when our reps go into an account, they're focused on one thing and that's Rohrbach beer and selling Rohrbach beer and, and working with our accounts. Um, it's worked extremely well for us. Um, and of course, there is a margin that you're giving up by going through those distributors. Uh, it has its problems, but I tell you, for us, it's opened up many doors for us. Um, you look at the relationship, and we'll talk a little bit about partnerships, or I wanted to talk about partnerships. We have a strong relationship with Frontier Field, and Frontier Field is where the Red Wings play. Um, the only way that you tend to be able to play in those, we'll call it an arena, but that overall is to support them through sponsorships. Uh, the State Liquor Authority doesn't necessarily want that to be linked directly, but the reality is you have to do some advertising and some sponsorships. If I went through a distributor and they took off a percentage of our margins in order to, to do the functions that they do, I wouldn't be able to play in that frontier field and, and buy those signs and do those sponsorships. So that's opened up so many doors for us. Uh, most of the other breweries wouldn't think of doing self-distribution, but it's worked out well for us. Still on the accounting front, because we're talking accounting, I think it's really important. Many uh, restaurateurs don't look at how they look at their costing the same way. Uh, again, even if you're quite knowledgeable, you're certainly going to look at your food costs, your direct uh, beverage costs and your liquor costs. If you're buying beer, you're going to look at all those things. And then you tend to look at your labor separately. Uh, but what I think is a better way to do it, it's worked out really well for Roarbox is we look at prime costs. I don't know if this is just in our industry. Maybe you've already learned about it. It wasn't something I knew right away. It wasn't something I learned at school, but prime costs to me are looking at your direct cost of goods, but then adding in all of your labor costs. And for restaurants, it's, it's really all your direct costs. So I look at managers and servers and bartenders and cooks and dishwashers and all of the benefits that we you know, provide to them and all the costs like worker comp and everything goes along with it to get what we call prime costs. And I always focus on making sure that our prime costs are 55% or less, which will give me 45% to deal with SG&A and everything else that goes along with it. 
And, and I can tell you that rule of thumb for me has provided for a very a profitable restaurant, two, two restaurant operations at a 1.3. Um, and many restaurants struggle through that. So I was just a little added accounting note that I always use. Uh, the other thing that I would finish on when we're talking about accounting and business is the importance I always put on the relationships I have with my vendors. Um, vendors are always looking for our business and it's very easy to fall into the trap to say, well, this person I'm currently doing business with, I don't need to do business with because people are knocking on my door for my business. I, I don't have to be loyal to that person. Uh, we don't have to treat, I can treat them any way I want. I've never felt that way. I felt we had to find important suppliers and vendors, and that we had to develop a partnership with them. And there isn't much that I bring to the table. You know, I'm requiring them to give me the very best price they have because I want to keep my costs down and I want to be able to pass those cost savings and charge my customer reasonable prices. So that's not a huge benefit. The one thing that I do do is try to take as large orders as possible. I don't want my vendors to have to come to my back door with supplies five times a week. We should be able to take an inventory and have them come once and one invoice. And then the other very important thing is to pay them on time. And um, th that is so important for them. One, it's one of their key, um, key measures of performance, uh, KPSs, is, is to make sure that their accounts receivable are low. Well, Roarbox always pays their bills right on time. And I can tell you for the small local suppliers that I do business with, we buy some handmade pierogies from a small operator. We do business with some small local bakeries. I pay them every single week because I know how important that cash flow is to them. Um, and I can tell you it's paid off in benefits many, many times over. But during the pandemic, more than ever, because supplies were really tight. And I do that for our service suppliers too. Sometimes they're overly busy with certain issues that they might have with other customers. When I get on the phone to them, they come right to Roarbox because I've always paid them on time and treated them fairly as far as their pricing and other things. So it's just, they are part of an, an in, integral part of the success of your business. I think it's important. And then on the reverse side too, I have to tell you, I expect my customers to pay us on time. It's far too easy to say, well, I really need this customer. I really, you, you know, you, you can work with people and I understand that. And again, that's part of that partnership. But for the most part, you have to ask them to make sure they pay you on time also. That's the last thing. And that is important so that I can pay my suppliers on time. I have to make sure my accounts receivable don't grow too much. So I hope people don't mind, but I, I, a little bit of accounting there. I, I figured it was apropos and I hope uh, we, that generates some questions. The other thing that I've learned over time- We do have time, a question, John, if I can interrupt for a minute. We do have sure. a question in the chat box. Is sure, what is sure, your credit system like in this business? What is the repeat that? What's credit the, system, what is the credit system like in this business? Well, if, if uh, the nice thing is, that's really honestly a very good question. The nice thing about me selling controlled beverages is through the liquor authority. We have to have a special license to do that. Customers have to pay us on time or we have to notify the liquor authority that they are beyond their terms. So we are fairly generous with the terms that we provide as long as the business that's been around for some time. I mean, it's restaurants notoriously have a very high failure rate. So I'm not saying we have not had bad debt over the years. <laughs> I, think, I think we found my other slide. So that's great. Thank you so much for, for jumping in and doing that. <laughs> um, sorry for the technical issues, but we're all used to it with Zoom anyway, right? So to, to get back to Rob's question uh, or the question that came in, uh, we have a strict uh, terms, but we're pretty generous with our credit, even with new restaurants. And even though we've had some bad debts, they never get too big because people have to pay us within a 30-day period of time, every really every two weeks. So the receivables never get too big. I hope that answers your question. If not, please ask it in another way. And thank you for that, for that uh, question. So the importance of networking in business. Uh, it's something maybe I didn't realize right away. But shortly after I opened Roarbox, I realized that I have a choice. And many entrepreneurs feel uh, they know their business very well. 
Uh, they've studied up on it and they know best and they don't really need anyone else to give them any input or influence the decisions they make. I think that that's a very dangerous way to manage. I think that the world and the markets change so fast that if you don't have trusted uh, peers, people that are in your business, and a lot of people are very close to the chest with the information that they give, we all have our trade secrets. You don't have to give up your trade secrets to have trusted um, really peers in your business that are doing the same thing that you can get on the phone to and say, listen, I have an issue with this particular vendor. Do you have someone you'd recommend? Um, we're switching our point of sale system. What's your recommendation? I'm looking at this system. What do you think? I think it's critically important. I have many friends that we do this reciprocal. It goes back and forth. I reciprocate with the information, I'm very open about our information, even though they are competitors of ours, I will tell them and be very honest because I want them to succeed. The fact that they succeed isn't necessarily, doesn't mean that I won't, it's not a zero sum game. As an industry, we can all get better and grow our industry if we help each other out. Uh, I learned this through trade organizations. Uh, this picture that just popped up, is actually a visit we did with the Brewers Association down to Washington to talk about you know, important issues that we have. Uh, I've been on the board of the New York State Restaurant, or the Restaurant Association. Actually, I was a chairman of the board and I have many friends and, and operators that I knew from New York City to Boston, or excuse me, to Buffalo, to uh, Albany, all around the state. And it was a real honor to, to be the chair, uh, but also I've nurtured friends around the industry uh, one thing I'd say about trade organizations, this is another takeaway if you want to write something down. If you are interested in a particular industry that you know this is what you'd like to do, trade organizations many times have individual memberships or student memberships. I signed up to the National Brewers Association well before I opened my company, and I was uh, privy to their uh, trade shows which allowed me to get to buy my equipment to get started. They had um, actually magazines at the time. I don't know there was too much internet, but I got their magazines, which just gave me tremendous information on how to get started and, and continue to go. So I would recommend doing that if you could and get involved in trade organizations. It's, a, it's the best way to network with others that are facing the same issues that you have and also keep really cutting edge with what's happening in the business. What are the latest trends and how do we deal with those trends? I go back to uh, forgetting about networking, network within your company. I kind of mentioned that before. Um, I talked about the priority I put on our staff, but I also network with our staff too, which means I really do go down. I try to listen to them. They are on the front line. If we are having issues with any kind of quality that we have, my staff's going to find out much before I do sitting up in the office. You need to, you know, my job is to really give them the tools to succeed and to make sure if there are things that are holding them back, that we alleviate those concerns and those challenges. And I can only do that by listening to the staff and what they have to do. Um, I would repeat too, relationships are important. I cannot tell you, I'm going to look at our timing here. I cannot tell you the times that I've caught, talked to customers who I've truly built relationships with. And we've been challenged from a competitor taking over our business and almost to 100% because of the relationship I have, uh, they will come to me and say, listen, we've been offered this price or these products and we are considering going with them instead of Roarbox. And, and I can tell you, they always at least give me an opportunity to counter that without pulling the rug out from under me. And that's because we have developed relationships and it's really important. Uh, I'll go through this really fast. I don't want to put myself in the category of a good guy. I, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I can tell you having high business standards, being honest with your customers and with your staff sometimes hurts you in the short run. Uh, you can kind of push the envelope a little bit. You can cheat a little over here. You can do this. But in the long run, and we've been doing this 30 years, if you take the high road, you, you will always be better off. It, it always comes back. You may have short-term profits because of something you cut a corner on or didn't do quite honestly, 
it's always going to cost you in the long run. And I would, you know, I, I would strongly encourage, encourage you to try to, to do that. So I think with this new slide, it looks like I, I don't have control of it. So if some, if, if Rob, if you have it, perfect. Thank you very much. We zip to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to move right along here. I've been uh, prattling on maybe a little too long, but one of the things I did want to talk about is the impact of COVID. And I want to do this quickly because I'm really hoping and, and praying honestly that we're coming out of this and we'll never experience it again, but you never know. Uh, E-commerce was clearly our friend during COVID. Um, our industry, the restaurant industry, um, was probably hurt as much or more than any other industry because we were totally shut down for at least two periods of time. Um, I always thought my company was diverse because we had the wholesale and we had the retail. But when the industry shuts down, not only did my retail shut down, I didn't sell any beer either because my wholesale shut down. So we had to adapt and move very quickly. I'm, I'm normally slow and steady with what we do. We had to make quick decisions and we did that and our staff really stepped up and did it. The other thing I found that was really important for us was it was an extremely stressful time for managers, for staff. Um, we had to do health screenings and check-ins and mass and social distancing. And we were losing people because of tracing or maybe they had COVID or the family had COVID. Uh, we were losing people. Um, uh, our demand was all over the board. There were weeks we had none or weeks we had a lot. People had to do with less and we had to somehow find a way of not having everyone jump off the cliff. It was extremely difficult, but we found ways to support them and get through it together, do it as a team. And it really worked out. The other thing that I think will pay off and we're starting to see it already as we come out of COVID is that we, we talk about long-term, you know, think putting a hat on that's more long-term. Corporate people that have uh, publicly traded companies have to worry about quarterly results. Uh, they've told the street, this is what we expect our returns to be. If they don't hit it, they're in trouble. What we try to do is I don't have to, to answer to the street or to Wall Street or uh, to investors. I look long-term. If, if my profits for the month or the quarter or the year are not what I wanted them to be, as long as we maintain that relationship with our customers and we, we keep our brand strong, we're far better off. We did some things to our wholesale accounts. They were really suffering. Restaurants closed. Cash flow is really tough. Uh, we took the, the state liquor authority allowed us to take a product back, which they normally don't. It was the last thing I wanted to do because I knew if I took returns, I couldn't resell it. We mostly would have to dump that product. But again, it's about relationships. We took product back and we did have to destroy it. Financially, it was very costly for me, but our customers, many people say people have short-term memories. When you take care of people, when they're on their knees and they're really struggling, uh, they will not forget that. And I believe that we'll come out of this a much stronger company. And I, I know for sure that customers will remember that Rohrbox was there when they were really struggling. So we'll hit the next slide. We'll go through this quick too. Uh, part of what we do too that we haven't talked about is that we do event marketing. Uh, we put on the Flower City Brewers Fest, which I am uh, not too humble in saying, I think is the premier event in town. I know it draws the biggest attendance and has the most breweries. We've been doing it for many, many years. Um, the first note there is very important because I made sure that I had an RIT grad who is our marketing director run the, the, the festival. So uh, she does a great job. And um, you, you certainly, we want to be a leader in the local market for craft breweries. If we put on and host the largest event that is in our industry, that gives us that leadership role. We have an opportunity to strengthen our brand by putting on a great event. Uh, there are lots of things that can go wrong with event. We have just as much a risk to hurt ourselves if we don't put on a really good event. So we have to focus on details and make sure that it's about the experience that the person has, not how much money necessarily Roarbox is going to net from this event. It's about making sure that when people walk out of the Flower City Brewers Fest, the first thing they think about is that they cannot wait to sign up for next year's event. Uh, we also have a VIP section which sells out in a really like less than an hour. Uh, that helps us too, because it makes it hard to get. 
and then people are very anxious to come back. But um, it does produce a little bit of revenue for us. Uh, we take on some risks, but we're really glad that we do it. And it also challenges our staff. It gives our staff an opportunity to really face-to-face uh, -to, -face to customers. Many of our brewers are down there working hard all the time, but they don't get a chance to have customers come up to them and say, we love the products that you make. Rob, why don't we hit to the next slide? So I'll run through this quick and make sure that we have some uh, time for questions. I hope we do have some questions. I just wanted to few takeaways from this. Uh, the educational experience and relationships are key. I've said that enough. Uh, I do think it's important outside of your walls. Volunteer, the organizations that I mentioned, the trade organizations, those aren't paid board positions. Uh, they're a way to give back. They're a way to network. And giving back, yeah, that's part of my core value, I believe. It was the way I was brought up. But it benefits in the way our brand is perceived by customers and the way our, our uh, staff thinks about the, the work that they do at Roarbox. Start small and build from there. Great things do take time. Again, that, that, is not, that does not apply to everyone, but it worked very well for Roarbox. 13 years uh, later, 13 years later, listen to me, 30 years later, uh, we have a staff of 80 people and we're throughout the state. Um, there's 9,000 breweries in the United States. We're in the top 500, which is a pretty good percentage. We're not one of the top 50, but, but we're a decent sized company, but it took a long time to get there. Um, when you pick your outside advisors, no company will be able to survive or grow without good accountants, of course, first off, but then attorneys, uh, architects, um, any kind of professional people that you hire. Uh, sometimes people say, well, let's look at price. Price is important, but I can tell you, you can, I would use your advisors sparingly so it's not too expensive, but get the best ones that you can. Ones that listen to you, what your problems, what your issues are, and are true partners in making your business succeed. Uh, I don't know all the tax laws. Um, my accountants help with that. When we're making capital expenditures, whether to charge sales tax or not, I, I rely on them and they keep me out of trouble and keep my business growing. Uh, customer service is long-term. Uh, I think it's much more important than short-term profits. And then the last note there is that even after our uh, talk here today, feel free to reach out to me. That's my direct email address. Uh, I, I love to uh, answer questions or would love to answer questions if you want to network or I can help in any way, reach out to me by email. Rob, I think the next slide would be questions. So I will zip it for a minute here and see if anyone has any questions. And I uh, do want to thank you all again for your time uh, this afternoon. Very nice. And, and thank you, John. That was uh, informative. And, and <clears throat> even after knowing you for all these years and, and being a patron of Roarbox, I, I learned quite a bit. So, so thank you. Um, we'd like to open it up at this time for, for questions, um, although I am going to ask the first question because in all the years that I've known you, John, there's always one question that I've been dying to ask you. Of all the beers that Roarbox has made, both past and present, because there are some that have come on seasonal, some that have been retired, what is your favorite beer that you've produced over the years? Oh, Rob, you, know, you, you don't, don't tell everybody this, but I think... We came out with a porter almost in the beginning. Well, I, I should preface this too. I think Rob probably knows. We have a Scotch Ale, which is our flagship, which mm -hmm. is not the most popular style of craft beer. And I'm really glad for that because there isn't a lot of competition. We kind of own that little niche. Uh, we do have our IPAs, which is the most popular. But to answer your question, I think it's Sam Patch Porter. It was a porter we produced really in the very early days. And we bring it back as a throwback once in a while but it's a traditional English style porter, nice and malty, and uh, probably the beer I enjoy drinking the most. And, I, and of course, I, I'm not sampling yet, but we're about to start our uh, release party for Red Wing Red that Rob's going to. So this is also one of my favorites. Very nice. And, and I do have to say, I agree with you, Sam Patch Porter, I thought was the best uh, beer paired with chicken wings. <laughs> That's just my opinion back in the day. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> but so, so uh, I will invite uh, students or, or any of our attendees to ask questions. I've got several, um, so, so I'll give it a second here. If somebody wants to come off of mute, please feel free to ask a question. 
do we have any entrepreneurs out there that have a little seed in the back of their head that someday they want to start their own company? I think we've got a question from Stephen Gold has asked, uh, what do you do to attract and retain your workers? You know, Rob, uh, that, that's a great question. Attract is, is, is difficult to some extent. Uh, I think some of your previous um, speakers on the, the earlier series talked about culture. Uh, culture translates into the brand. So I think as people look at our brand, uh, we do have to kind of reach out and see who's who's out there. And I'm telling you, depending on the, the right now, it's hard to get people. It's far better to, uh, you know, it's, it's far easier to create that culture once people are in and they love what they do to keep them, keep them challenged. Attracting people is really about how people look at your brand and the culture. And then we do an extensive interview process. And I can tell you, I feel that we also focus on onboarding. So that from the minute someone is, is hired at Roarbox, they're part of the team and they really feel that they're part of the team. We have a, I don't know if anybody's heard of Basecamp, actually our RIT marketing director got us turned on to that. It's a great way for us to communicate internally. And it doesn't matter what, what level of staff you are, you're involved in decisions of naming products, um, menu items, you know, they, they, events we should be involved in that gets them involved and have some ownership and even major decisions that we're making as a company. I hope that answered the question. Nice. Um, I can go next if. Sure. Hi, uh, hi John, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I wanted to ask what brings in more revenue, the wholesale side of the business or the retail side of the business? Say, say that one more time, the revenue on what side of the business? Uh, the wholesale wholesale side of the business or the retail side of the business? What yeah, that, that's a really good question. I, I might have mentioned during my talk that, um, and, and we do look at, these are different divisions and we there are profit centers on their own. The beer hall is a profit center. Uh, our e-commerce is a profit center. Wholesale beer, our brew pub is all different profit centers. If I look at the retail side, which is the restaurant, um, most of the, the e-commerce that we do online is, is retail and then the brew pub. That was more than 50% of our business until maybe six or eight years ago. Uh, so the lion's share of our, our existence, wholesale was the piece that was always growing. We were very lucky on the retail side that our, we have four walls. So on a Friday night, if Rob, Rob, if you've been to Buffalo Road on Friday night, you know you can't jam too many more people in there. We're very lucky. It was hard to grow that very much because we had restrictions as to how much volume we could do. And we were doing about as much as we could wholesale wise we could always continue to grow. So that had a really nice steady growth. And about eight years ago, it's, it um, exceeded our retail sales. And now I would say it is probably 70% of our overall revenue is wholesale and about 30% is the retail side. Um, so for the wholesale side, if you want to get your product listed on Wegmans or Walmart, like who's the decision maker uh, for that area? Like how do you get your product listed and how does that transaction go ahead? Yeah, that's also a great question. It's very unique for our industry because the liquor authority, you know, many people think that um, in the supermarket, in order to get shelf space, you pay for it. And to be honest with you, that is how it normally works, except for controlled beverages, uh, beer and some, not in New York State, but wine in some places, because the liquor authority won't allow you to buy space. So we do it, uh, you know, I always say we earn it. We get the opportunity, we try to nurture those relationships. We get a chance to get on the shelf. And the only way you keep that shelf space is to generate sales. So we come out with the best products we can. We have um, our classics, which are available all year long. We have our seasonals. Red Wing is one of those seasonals, just comes out in the summer. We have an Irish ale or Christmas ale. They come out the same time every year, same products. We have what we call our small batch series, which is just sold at Roarbox. We produce those products at Buffalo Road at the smaller brewery. And then we have what's called our Neoteric series. Neoteric is something that is a, a one-time release. Uh, it's unique, it's creative, it keeps us relevant. Uh, with all these new breweries opening up, they're always the one that get the buzz. Um, sometimes a traditional or a legacy brewery like ours uh, becomes not relevant. Neoterics make us creative and relevant all the time. So to really answer your question, we do the best we can to just crack that door open 
and then we earn that shelf space by generating sales. Uh, one last question before I, so um, regarding the e-commerce sales, I'm not sure about the legalities, but are you allowed to uh, sell your own craft beer on your websites, bypassing Wegmans, Walmart, and all these other big players? <laughs> That's a very good and pertinent question because with COVID, the governor through his executive orders allowed us to do that. Normally we couldn't. And I know that there's lots of talk within the industry of trying to maintain that right for us to do it directly. We have to be very careful in doing that. Even when we sell beer at Rohrbox at retail, if you come into the restaurant and you walk out with a growler or a four pack, um, we don't want to push that too much because our retail partners are really what's important. I want that those retail sales. We have to be very careful how we do that. But the governor has allowed us to mail product through within the state. Um, if I were to look at my crystal ball because of the strength of the uh, wholesalers and the retailers, most likely I think that executive order will expire and will go back to the way it was, even though the Brewers Association is lobbying us for us to continue to have that right. That, that would be my guess. Um, I, hope, I hope we keep that right, but it's, it's a balance all the time to make sure that you are generating as much direct sale as you can, but you have to support your retailers. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Hey, John, this is, uh, my name is Jesse Magistrato. I had a question for you. Um, thanks for your time today. And um, yeah, thanks for introducing me to the Rochester area. When I got here in 2005, the, uh, the Roar Box on Buffalo Road was one of the first places my buddies took me uh, when I moved here uh, to New York. So I didn't know anything about Rochester, moved here and they took me to Roar Box, said, you got to go to this place. So appreciate <laughs> the introduction to the area. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that you were, I think you said you were the number 142 microbrew in the, in the United States and others over, over 900. Um, what would you say the biggest change is that you've made to your business um, because of the, the explosion of the competitive landscape? Uh, just thank, thank you for, for that question. And tell your friend, too, I owe him a commission for bringing you in. Uh, <laughs> it might be a little past due, but I owe it to him anyway. But thank you. And thanks for the kind words. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think the biggest thing is, and we were lucky that, I, I guess I say lucky, we didn't go geographically really wide. I can't, I don't know. I think I told you that if we were in 13 states, it's very hard. The regional breweries that don't have all the resources to properly, you know, uh, the bandwidth to, to deal with out of state, let's say Pennsylvania or Ohio, uh, they really struggle because Pennsylvania and Ohio have all their own local breweries. The biggest thing is that I think it's brought our focus into our local market to say, hey, this is our most important market. This is where, this is the center of the target where we can do our best and push the fact that we're local. And we never got to be so big that I lost all that volume and, and now I have this overhead that I can't deal with. Um, so I think it, it was just refocusing on local and there's 25 breweries here locally. I think the Neoteric series being relevant, having really good social media, having events to bring people in, um, we're just as intense as ever to be that lead brewery and make sure we remain as relevant as possible. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. I think uh, Professor Dresnick has a uh, comment and question, Bill, if, if you're able to, to join for a second. A whole bunch, but I'll try to limit it. Hi, John. Um, Bill Dresnick, I'm accounting faculty, and in the fall, you worked with one of my executive MBA groups. Um, I don't know if you remember, four or five executive students, so thank you for that, and thank you for being here today as well. Um, I'm a longtime fan. Uh, went to the, uh, the, South, the South Wedge uh, uh, you know, Rohrbox way back in the day. And I used to go with my family about weekly to the, uh, the Gates location. And I want you to know that my youngest daughter, who's now 18, um, would keep records of the best chicken fingers, fries, and honey mustard in the area and all the restaurants she ever went to. And Rohrbox was always number one. And the vanilla porter is one of my favorites. Um, and I just want to mention these days, I'm interim chair of the hospitality department. And I don't know if there's anything we can do to help you. Um, but I think, you know, hospitality, brew pubs, I mean, all the different things going on in Rochester. I know you're an active leader in the community, um, but we've got resources, we've got people, we've got students, 
Um, so if there's anything we can do to give back, you're giving so much to the Saunders College, um, just let me know and we'll figure out a way to, to do that. So thank you for all that you do and all that you've done. Bill, Bill thank you very much. And I, without knowing your daughter, I know she has very good taste. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I do remember the students coming in and I can tell you, I was, I had mentioned to the group how important I felt it was that they, you know, open up and share and, and give back. You know, I gave back a little, but I can tell you the recommendations that that team came in, you know, your students came in, the executive students, um, it was outstanding for us. We implemented some of the things, they pointed out some things that I would never think of. So, you, you know, I, I think it's important to give back. And I can tell you through the Restaurant Association, please continue to do what you're doing. We need professionals that want to get into our business. Uh, it's a business that won't go away. You, you know, it's not technology is coming into our business, but it's not gonna eliminate the fact that we are a people focused business. We still need that interaction and those jobs are still gonna be there and they have to manage people. And I don't think lifestyles are gonna change. Pandemic maybe took a little away, but I think people will get back and they wanna go out and they want to experience a, a good restaurant or a nice hotel. So keep doing what you're doing, we'll stay in touch. If Roarbox can help in any way through internships or whatever, we love to do that. We've done it over the, I think I've mentioned, um, our marketing manager, uh, our marketing director, Brittany Stat, she started as an intern from RIT and uh, she um, made some mistakes through other places. I, I'm saying that kiddingly. She worked at some really good corporations, but ended up back at Rohrbach. She learned a lot and she's a tremendous asset to us. So internships have always been great. And I hope that we always provide something good for the students. So thank you for, uh, thank you for those comments. Thanks. We have an interesting question. Uh, Caitlin Connolly from uh, put a message out here in the chat box. Um, this is a good one. When deciding on what beer to brew next, do you rely on market research or industry trends for guidance or what's popular? And how did your brewing team decide on what they want to try? That is a very good question. She's going to, but she's not going to stump me. Uh, again, this is a little <laughs> bit of a trade secret. I wouldn't say that. What Roarbox tries to do too, uh, because it's so competitive, a lot of people, as soon as something becomes popular, everybody jumps on. I, I can tell you, like, and I'm sure people uh, may know this, but Seltzers has had a huge impact on our business because they they really kind of, you know, I think locally they have maybe 14% 4, of the beer market. Well, those are people that are no longer, or maybe they are on occasion, but they have made choices to buy Seltzers or consume Seltzers instead of craft beer. Uh, it's been a challenge. There's a lot of breweries that are saying, well, we're going to make seltzers. Roarbox, we've decided not to. There's a number of reasons that I won't get into it. But we try not to just trace or, or chase uh, the recent trends. We try to do it on our own. But we're kind of lucky because we have two busy retail operations. We have two breweries. One's a production brewery that makes very large batches. One's really small. So we make small batches at Buffalo Road. We encourage all of our staff to give their creative ideas, not just the brewer at Buffalo Road. Everybody funnels those ideas to Joel. He makes the beers. Social media is great because everybody has their little app that's untapped, which says they either like the beer or they don't like the beer. So we actually see, well, what are the ratings? What are customers saying? How well did it sell? Can we produce it on the big system? So we go through that process of looking at the small batches. So it's kind of like market research, but it's our own internal market research as to how well it did. And I have to tell you with Neoteryx, um, we don't always hit a home run. We know they're always good beers. You could have a great rating on Untapped and everybody likes it. I call it the connoisseurs or the geeks. Uh, they may like it, but the major consumers don't necessarily move the needle. So we've made some mistakes on that, but we have to keep trying and we do the very best we can. Uh, we have, and, and there's a whole team that decides what's our next Neoteric and they're planned out for the year. And there's times, it's funny, we have one scheduled for the, towards the end of the year. And we just came out with a Bananas Foster Scotch Ale that's incredibly popular. We may swap that, you know, our plans may change, but we're small enough to do that. So thank you for that question. That's really a good one. I hope I answered it for you. Yeah, definitely. This is Caitlin here. Um, and yeah, I tried the Bananas Foster Scotch Ale. It's great. So <laughs> really appreciate it. Thanks, Caitlin. I'm glad I used that for an example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you reckon, let me ask this, a little market research. Caitlin, would you say that that should be one of our next Neoterics? Sure. I mean, right. I know you did the Neapolitan Scotch Ale, so it'd be a good little mix up for that next year. For sure. All right. Well, that's one vote. <laughs> Happy to help.
Well, very good. Well, I think uh, this has been an exciting time. We're at time, so I want to be respectful of everybody's calendar, but uh, this has been an amazing conversation. John, we can't thank you enough for, for joining us, and, and for everybody that joined the, the conversation, thank you for, for coming. Um, John, this has been educational, enlightening, and uh, really appreciate everything that you've given to the community, as well as here to our, our students and faculty today. Well, thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. And, and feel free, everyone that's on, feel free to, to email me. I, I promise you, I'll get back to you directly. So thank you again for your time and, and, and for listening today. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Wu, back to you. I think you might be on mute. And I can put spotlight on myself. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is Ken again. And uh, I want to thank John again for this wonderful presentation. And I definitely learned a lot from that. And also I put my thank to moderator Rob and all the audience again. So um, our next sub event will be accounting banquet on April 29th. I know it's going to be a little bit longer uh, than the um, well, usual frequency we have, but please keep tuned to our announcement. And uh, this, uh, um, at this time, I'm going to conclude the session and um, hope everyone well and uh, see uh, each other again next time. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.